If you're even slightly a fan of horror, the likelihood is that you're familiar with some aspect of Dario Argento's 1977 Suspiria. Whether it be the gorgeous cinematography, graphic kills, or iconic score by Goblin. The film, part of Argento's Three Mothers trilogy, was inspired by Thomas de Quincey's 1845 prose poetry essay, Suspiria di Profundis. De Quincey's poems explore his experience as an addict to opium, as did his previous work, Confessions of an English Opium Eater. And the main connection between De Quincey's work and the 1977 interpretation of Suspiria is Argento's exploration of the Three Mothers, inspired by De Quincey's essay, Lavana and Our Ladies of Sorrow. In Argento's trilogy, the three matriarchs, the mother of tears, the mother of sighs, and the mother of darkness, are summed up by our old friend Wikipedia as a triumvirate of ancient witches and satanists whose powerful magic allows them to manipulate events on a global scale, killing anyone who gets in their way and who are determined to rule the world. This is quite a deviation from De Quincey's original work, which refers to them as three sorrows to counter the three graces or fates of Greek mythology. I myself interpret them as the characteristics that make up death. A tear, a sigh, and then the darkness. If you've watched any of my other videos, you might have noticed that I have tattoos on my fingers and these actually say tears and sighs because as you may have guessed, I really like this film. Despite having an incredibly simple premise, a girl studying ballet at a dance academy who discovers the school is run by a coven of witches, Suspiria is considered one of the best horror and giallo films, one of the best films of Argento's career, solidifying its place in film history. But in 2018, I Am Love and Call Me By Your Name director Luca Guadagnino debuted his own reimagining of Argento's Suspiria. Why did I roll my R? Curious. It does away with the iconic bright colors, the lighting, the alt rock score, and focuses far more on delving into the lore and plot and character backstories. If you've read many reviews, you'll know that some people complained about the supposedly drab visuals and seemingly meandering subplots. It almost feels like a completely different film. A film that for me manages to supersede the original. So let's get stuck into why. <laughs> So in Guadagnino's Suspiria, the basic premise of a ballet dancer arriving at a new academy is the same. This time we meet American ex-Mennonite Susie Banyan, played beautifully by Dakota Johnson, who arrives at the academy in Berlin 1977, the same year that the original film was made and during the latest stage of the Cold War. Her Mennonite background, a total addition to the original, has a lot of significance as the abuse she received in the conservative Christian household pushed her away from her home and her abusive mother and towards Berlin. In 2018 Suspiria, the witches are an acknowledged aspect of the film straight from the jump, with Chloe Grace Moretz's Patrizia opening. Am I saying Patrizia because of Lady Gaga? I am. That's her name in House of Gucci. That's not Chloe Grace Moretz's name in this film. It's just Patricia. Patricia opens the film explaining that the witches have insidious intentions to her therapist, Dr. Kemper. Tilda Swinton plays Dr. Kemper in prosthetics. Swinton's other role in the film is as dance tutor Madame Blanc, who takes a liking to Susie, seeing something special in her dance ability. All of the staff are witches and the students are unaware of the fact that their dance routines are actually enabling the coven to perform ritualistic magic. There is a really grim scene showing the direct correlation between the dancing and the coven's magic with shots of Susie dancing into cut with a scene where another student is gruesomely twisted and contorted seemingly by nothing. Each of Susie's movements correlating directly to another crack and crunch of the student's bones until she's left 
still alive but completely contorted in a puddle of her own blood and urine. As she's settling into the Academy, Susie is befriended by Mia Goth's Sarah, who is suspicious of the Academy's staff and warns Susie not to give in to them. And alongside this, we're occasionally taken behind the scenes to see the dealings of the coven. And importantly, we watch as they vote upon who should lead them between Madame Blanc and the ancient and at this point unseen Helena Marcos. Marcos has declared herself the reincarnation of Mother Suspiriorum, one of the most powerful witches and forces in this world, and therefore wins the vote. But Marcos's body is decaying, and she needs a human host in order to keep living and leading the coven, a responsibility that falls to Susie, who willingly agrees to it despite the skepticism of Madame Blanc. And this takes us to the final act and one of my favorite scenes in any film ever. Susie arrives for the transferal ceremony and there are witches and students performing a dance ritual. We see Helena Marcos and her deformed body for the first time and in a total deviation from the original story, Susie reveals that it is actually she who is the embodiment of Mother Suspiriorum and has come to end the corruption of the coven in a beautifully bloody, gory, erratic scene set to the score by Radiohead's Tom York. She calls upon death to kill Marcos and the others that voted for her. And that's pretty much Suspiria 2018 summed up. There's one more very significant scene that I'm gonna discuss later regarding a character that we haven't really got into yet. But regarding the surface plot, it's a fresh start for the coven and the academy who under Susie's leadership will hopefully seek to do good rather than serve themselves. It goes without saying that as a film with almost an all female cast, Suspiria 2018 has connected with a lot of women. It's not something the film even acknowledges, which I'm thankful for, to be honest, because I can't stand films being any way labeled as female films. There's no dumb girl power monologuing or corporate America trying to sell you the message that they think will sell best. The film just taps into something innately female. The movement, the sexuality, the sisterhood, it all feels incredibly organic. As seen particularly in Call Me By Your Name, Guadagnino has such a sensitivity to his directing style, and it really translates perfectly from the context of queerness in that film to femininity in this one. So with this in mind, the first time I watched this film, my focus was on the innately female aspects of the story. It's expressions of repression and female rage, which I still believe to be unquestionably there, but perhaps as more of a means than an end. Susie is the most important signifier of this rage and repression, as brief flashbacks of her childhood home show her being punished for not fulfilling her duties as a young Mennonite woman. And at one point, her mother even burns her hand with a hot iron as a punishment for masturbation. Susie is seemingly quiet and delicate, but these glimpses and the way they're actually shot and edited as quick, volatile flashbacks of her childhood in Ohio with brief and occasional shots of more surreal imagery are a direct representation of the turmoil beneath the sweet facade. They show the dark creature many of us feel somewhere inside created by our torment and pain in waiting. And as the visions increase and Susie finds a home in the academy, the metaphorical creature gets stronger. The reveal that Susie is the mother of size, Mother Suspiriorum, something that isn't even clear that she knows until towards the end of the film, is vital to this reading. Becoming Suspiriorum is the result of Susie coming together with this darkness and working in tandem to fuel her transition. Similarly to Robert Eggers' The Witch, there is this idea that 
you create something with fear. In that film, Thomason's family accusing her of being a witch is what creates the divide between them, eventually leading her to become one. Similarly here, Susie, whose family tried to shape her into a docile woman and punish her for having her own desires, created this rage in her that makes her strong and defiant and gives her her power. I often look in cinema for stories that are able to reflect this idea in a way that is more nuanced than just trauma makes you stronger. And I think Suspiria 2018 is successful in this. I grew up in the church and though my home life was wonderful and I still have an overall positive relationship with my faith, the purity culture more than heavily encouraged by the church we went to when I was in my teens was in some ways traumatizing. It shaped my relationship with my body and my sexuality in a way that really endangered my happiness. Some of the more insidious teachings of purity culture in the church still fill me with so much anger, but it's in experiencing all of this that I've become the person that I am now. And I found so much power in what's been taken from me. I see this in Suspiria and I feel so grateful to have an outlet for these complex emotions. I've probably watched Suspiria 2018 five or six times now and my ongoing fascination with the film has led me to consume more and more media doing its best to break down what it all means. I've come across many interpretations of the film, but given Guado de Nino's, Guado de Nino's, holy fuck. Given Guado de Nino's distinct choices of setting and period, I've come to believe that an examination of corruption amongst political powers is the director's intended message. So Spiria 2018 is a direct exploration of dictatorship and war, existing to condemn political corruption and abuses of power enacted by our political leaders, which is reflected in the story of the Academy, but also more obviously and perhaps more oddly if you're familiar with the original film, in the setting. As I mentioned previously, the film is set in Berlin, 1977, the year that the original film was made and during the later period of the Cold War. The Cold War was a lengthy struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union that began in the aftermath of the surrender of Hitler's Germany in 1941. Nazi aggression against the USSR turned the Soviet regime into an ally of the Western democracies. But in the post-war world, increasingly divergent viewpoints created rifts between those that were once allies. In 1945, as World War II came to a close, Germany was divided during the Cold War between the Western Allies and the Soviet Union, with the two countries in the East and the West not being united again until 1990. Germany was divided into four occupied zones, British, French, the United States, and the Soviet Union. And Berlin itself, the capital city located in Soviet territory, was also divided into four zones with the same occupants. As you can imagine, Berlin in this time as the capital city of Germany was an incredibly difficult and dangerous place to be. The setting has very small on the film with things like Patricia's disappearance, being dismissed by the Academy's staff because of her involvement with possibly dangerous political groups. There's also a scene early on where a bomb is dropped in the background during a conversation between Susie and Sarah. But the most obvious connection that the Cold War backdrop has to the main story is developing the backstory of Dr. Kemperer. From what I read and saw during the film's initial release, a lot of people were confused by the inclusion of Dr. Kemperer, a side plot about a character that was almost non-existent in the original film. But the longer I've sat on it, the more I see Kemperer's story as crucial to Guadagnino's political statements. Kemperer is Patricia's therapist we meet earlier in the film, subjected to her true but totally unreasonable sounding fears and theories about the coven running the Academy. Though he at first seems to believe she is delusional, after Patricia's disappearance and contact from Sarah, who is searching for her, 
he becomes aware that the witches are a terrifying reality. Here and there we see him visit his old home, where he previously lived with his wife Anka, a Jewish woman who we learn was taken to a concentration camp and killed during the war. As the witches become aware of Kemper's knowledge of them, they cast a cruel spell on him, making him believe that Anka has returned to him. It's heartbreaking when suddenly he's alone on the street, confused, looking around in horror as she vanishes once again from beside him. He is then rushed and captured by the witches to be taken to be a part of the final ceremony at the school. Kempera is stripped naked and laying before the horrifying ceremony, forced to bear witness to both the would-be atrocity of Marcus's transferal and the ultimate outcome of seeing the physical embodiment of death climb out of the floor and make a bunch of people's heads explode. His position in the story and in this singular act of terror is as a witness forced to experience incredible cruelty and trauma, accidentally entangling himself within the wickedness of the coven because of the care he had for some of their students. And he's left traumatized by the horrific incidents he witnessed, as were generations of German citizens and Jewish people. Keeping in mind that Kempera has already been shown to be the victim of the previous Nazi rule in Germany, his present day story mirrors his past. To the greater powers here, the coven, and in reality, the political regimes ruling Germany at the time, his pain and suffering are irrelevant to their cause. As with the dancers at the studio, like Patricia or Sarah, who die during the final ceremony, the irreversible damage to his life and psyche are simply collateral damage. The witches working for their own gain had no concerns by the innocent people affected by their bid for power. Suspiria 2018 has been reimagined to expose these injustices to the innocent and to expose the cruelty and selfishness with which our leaders rule and operate. I mentioned earlier that there was one more scene crucial to the overall story. And that is when we see Susie, now as Mother Suspiriorum, visit Dr. Kemper as he recovers from witnessing the traumatic and murderous ceremony. How many times can I say trauma, fun game? Watch my videos and drink every time that I say trauma. Susie apologizes for the abuse that he experienced at the hands of the witches. And in order to make amends, she wipes his memory of both the witches and his wife lost to the Holocaust. In doing so, removing the pain and guilt he suffered as an innocent victim to two corrupt political movements. As she does this, she says, we need guilt, doctor, and shame, but not yours. I'm gonna quote directly here from a brilliant article by Chris Lambert at Film Colossus, as I don't think I can do a better job of articulating the significance of this line. The guilt and shame society needs isn't that of those who have witnessed atrocity. It's of those who would be our leaders, our politicians, our law enforcement, our corporate leaders. If Marcos had any sense of shame and guilt, she'd have never tried to carry out her plot. If Hitler and the rest of the Nazi leaders or advocates had a proper sense of shame and guilt, the Holocaust doesn't happen. It's a heavy message to bear, especially in comparison to the thrill ride that is the original film. But I applaud Guadagnino for taking the opportunity to really say something with Suspiria.